everyone, welcome to episode 32 of the Average Ontario Anglers Fishing Podcast. Today's podcast is the Frigid Fall Fishing Podcast. <laughs> Andrew, make your best frigid noises. Ooh. Exactly. <laughs> My name is Jesse. I'm the host of this episode and the producer of this fishing show. <laughs> I added, oh, we're assigning labels to ourselves now. I, I added producer. I'm it also the fancy. face of our organization. <laughs> yeah. Joining me as always is the man with the mustache, the face of the organization, the weird <laughs> face, Andrew. So if you're just joining us for the first time, welcome, of course. This is a safe place. We aim for this weekly podcast to be fun, inspiring, and relatable for many anglers all over Ontario, but we have listeners all over the world. Not a lot of them, but there are random followers from all over the world. So if you are one of those random people, thanks. If you're an avid angler or just getting started, this podcast is for you. Mm -hmm. So September is gone. It's gone. Dunzo. And you know, it, it is a shame though, because September is probably my favorite month of the year for fishing. And I'll tell you why. You're not hot and sweaty. That's great. There's less bugs. It's not too cold yet. You know, you still have those days when you can just wear like, you know, a t-shirt even. But... You know, there's a lot of really good fishing opportunities in the fall, isn't there? I mean, like, it's probably one of the best months, in my opinion, for muskie. Yes. Because, like, I like fishing shallow water muskie. So you got, you know, really good muskie fishing. You got the main push of salmon mm -hmm. up in the harbors and the creeks. A lot of people, you know, take advantage of that. And, uh, you know, even bass fishing. These fish are shallow and they're feeding up for the winter. I so caught my best bass last year in the fall. Yeah, and it's great. September's great. But just like Betty White, affordable housing and Ted Lasso. <laughs> All good things must come to an end. Andrew has a crush on, on Betty White, so he's laughing a bit. I, so. I do. Man, Golden Girls? Yeah. Oh, her prime. Thank you for being a friend. <laughs> anyway, today we're talking about fall fishing. And in the next hour or so, we're going to specifically discuss three types of fish that are great to target in the fall. And the kicker is all of these three species of fish can be targeted from shore. Yep. No boat required. That's Boats are dumb. Just kidding. Boats are awesome. That's bluegill sunfish, snakehead, and of course the paku, the ball nipper. Yeah. And that's why I'm the <laughs> producer of this show because we're not going to talk about those things. <laughs> so our podcast episode giveaway sponsor of the week is actually a really cool one. And it is Woolove Apparel. Now Woolove makes merino wool clothing and it's perfect for this time of year in the fall. I mean, it's getting cold. What are you thinking of? Base layers. <laughs> Base layers. So I had to do some research because I didn't know. What is merino wool? I'm going to ask you. Do you know off the top of your head? Uh, it's wool by Dan Marino. <laughs> so merino wool is wool from merino sheep. Uh, Obviously, okay. Yeah, I was like, oh, there's sheep. I didn't know there's different kinds of sheep. I'm a fisherman. I'm not a sheep guy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it, there, it's basically wool from this specific kind of sheep. Now, this kind of wool is thinner it's softer than regular wool, and it has a lot of a lot of crazy benefits compared to other types of materials. So some of the benefits is it's moisture wicking, it's breathable, and it's odor resistant. So Andrew will really enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta give me some of that. Yeah. And merino wool dries really quickly when it gets wet. I'm sure we've all had situations where like maybe we were releasing a fish and our sleeve got wet or, you know, we got a soaker or something like yep. that. And you're just uncomfortable because it's not summertime. Nothing's drying out fast. So at least if you're in merino wool, it's, you know, it's moisture wicking. So when you're sweating, if it does get hot during the day, you know, it's still comfortable. And if you do get some water on you, it's fast to dry. So that's cool. So we'd like to thank Wool Love Apparel for sponsoring this episode giveaway. Uh, and we're going to talk a little more about that later. Mm -hmm. If you would like to book a sponsored episode for season two, which is coming up really quick, send us an email and we will get you hooked up. But before you fall asleep... Hooked up. <laughs> That's a knee slapper. That is. But you missed the second joke. I said before you fall asleep. Uh, fall. Uh, we have an interesting fishing fact from the one and only man with a mustache, Andrew. <laughs> so, fall fishing, we're thinking of... Uh, fall is one of the best times to catch your personal best because fish are feeding up you're getting big fish you're fishing them, and these big fish are more accessible in the fall because they start moving perhaps shallower than they were midsummer in that heat yep now what is the first rule we always say if you buy like a top water or if you you know if you're musky fishing you always check your hooks 
or replace your hooks or update your hooks. Make sure they're sharp because yep. if you get a hit, you want to make sure that it connects. You want to have your best chance of landing that fish. So I was doing some research. There's two different ways that hooks get sharpened. Do you know the two different ways? Chemically? Yep. And uh, I don't know. Just, just mechanically. Mechanically, okay. Yep. So you're, you're, you know, if you're thinking of, you know, sharpening a knife on a grinder or, or, you know, on a whetstone, that's mechanically sharpening. Chemically sharpened, they use an acid and they'll dip the hook into it. And as they pull it out, the hook, the steel that's in the acid the longest gets eaten away more. So as they pull it out, essentially creates that point. That must be pretty precise acid. <laughs> <laughs> it's insane From what I acid. hear, acid is pretty crazy. So <laughs> I just asked the Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ringo. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, good job, Ringo. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know who Ringo is. Yeah, you're too young. You're too young. So I was thinking that, that I did some research on the pluses and minus, or the, what is the pros and cons okay. of both. That's interesting because that's something I've never thought of. Yeah. Okay. I know I hadn't until recently. So Are you, so Jesse just resharpened all of his musky hooks like, I did. across the board. I did. I, it all. took me hours. Now we're going to find out if maybe you did something wrong. I totally did. <laughs> <laughs> so mechanically, uh, so hooks from factory that were mechanically sharpened can be resharpened again and again. So you think of stuff like, um, let's go to hold on an example. Here's an old Len Thompson. And these old hooks, like they just, they get ground down. And these are, are coated afterwards. But you know, like the old steel, like on old baits and stuff like that, you get these like steel hooks and yeah. they're literally sharpened. You'll get some grooves and some, some scarring perhaps around the hook point because it's a ground down to a point. But the metal itself, just like a knife edge, it's ground down. Uh, the metal is still pristine. So it's not affected in any way. A chemically sharpened hook, the acid will actually weaken the the remaining metal to to a small degree. Now, some of the benefits of mechanically, so they they actually say you can't sharpen, you can't effectively sharpen, um, sorry, chemically sharpened hooks, because the remaining hook point that's there has been weakened by the acid, so it won't actually hold an edge the mm. same way as something that was just ground down because that's still pure steel that makes sense because like i've had a bunch of baits and they have like those wicked sharp like thin yep. wire bass hooks and you can't sharpen them yeah i just replace them yeah yeah that's interesting so some of the the differences between them uh so we'll start off with chemically sharpened hooks they're fantastic they they can oftentimes have a more finesse hook itself so even let's say these these treble hooks i'm pretty sure are chemically sharpened on this one here but I know that I think pretty sure the gamakatsu like finesse ones are chemically sharpened. Yeah. And what happens is they are insanely sharp and they actually have like residual coating and stuff on the hook itself that helps it uh, become less. Uh, it's harder for it to oxidize and rust. So they do have a special coating on them, generally speaking. You can have that with the ground ones as well. But generally the chemical ones, they get a bath afterwards that is also acts to help. Uh, prevent them from rusting okay they the chemically sharpened hooks generally have a sharper point because there's no imperfections with like a grinder or anything like that sharpening a hook so when it comes out of the acid it's it's coming out it's it's getting an even even sorry excuse me with a chemically sharpened hook as it comes out of the acid it's completely even on all sides so you're getting it right down to like an exact point Every single time. And that's the big benefit of them. Now they say it'll keep its point better than a mechanically sharpened hook. But once it loses its edge, you can't resharpen it. So you have to replace them. Hmm. With with a mechanically sharpened hook, so just like a regular steel hook that's been ground down, you can resharpen them again and again. But they are more likely, because it goes such to a fine point, on those, apparently they're more likely to fold over or lose that pointed edge, but you can just resharpen it. Yeah. So there's pros and cons to both. So some of the recommendations that are floating around that I that I saw is, oh, another thing with chemical, because when they create the barb on the hook, it removes less steel. So that's why it can be a, a finer hook and still have a, a barb and a good point because it's actually relo- removing less material than grinding it does. Makes sense. So 
some of the suggestions are if you're fishing around rocks, uh, if you're using a, so here's the, I've, I've heard both sides. You should be using, they say that you should be using a chemically sharpened hook because it'll help keep its edge better. I'll tell you this though, if you get any hook on a rock, it's no longer sharp. <laughs> so the benefit for me, I would say I would be fishing, if I'm, I'm fishing crankbaits and I'm going to be bumping bottom or something like that, I'm going to be fishing around, you know, timber. Personally, my preference would be I would want hooks that I can resharpen and I have a hook sharpener I can always keep in the boat with me. Yeah. I know Jesse keeps one in his tackle box with him. So if you, you know, you get snagged, the first thing you do, you just quickly look, give it a few strokes with the sharpener and you're, you're good to go. It has its edge again. Stuff like topwaters, uh, I really like chemically sharpened hooks because they're sticky sharp, like insanely yeah. sharp. And they're uh, far less likely to get, um, they're far less likely to get, you know, dull. Exactly. What are you going to snag on at the top water unless, you know, you're bad at casting like some people? <laughs> that I was burning myself there. Um, another one is, like, jigs don't have much, much of an option. There are some different brands that do both. But again, generally if your jig gets, gets dull, you just have to swap it out if it's chemically. Or you can sharpen it. But jigs are generally cheap. Uh, unless you're getting, like, bass jigs and stuff like that. But again... Uh, take a look at what brands uh, oftentimes the manufacturers will let you know what type of hook it is that they're using on those jigs and you can see if it's something that can be resharpened and you can continue using that same bait just doing some maintenance on it hmm. musky hooks is another one that uh, i really like just you know, i like the old steel hooks the best they're crazy strong and you can sharpen those and they get really sharp like you can get them sticky sharp on these these thick gauge hooks and you can just resharpen it all the time. So if I'm bringing it through and I've, you know, hit a bunch of weeds even. I've pulled a bait through a bunch of weeds. You know what? I'll look through it, look at it. And I'll just give the hooks a bit more of a sharpen and they're good to go. Yeah. If I snag into a log or you, you catch a fish, anything that has made contact with that hook point, I can resharpen it. Because musky hooks are expensive. <laughs> yeah. So I'd rather have good musky hooks that I can resharpen and keep going than ones that are uh, chemically sharpened and I have to replace if the edge gets dull. True. And like you said, having the the mechanically sharpened hooks always have a file on you. Like yes. I, one thing that I will pat ourselves on the back on, me and Andrew always have a hook file on us. I was actually fishing uh, a few weeks ago with my buddy Paul. We were fishing for muskie and I was several times he was fishing and I was just there sharpening my hooks because like, I was <laughs> smacking my, my baits onto rocks and I was like, oh, these hooks are brand new sharp hooks. I just sharpened them. I look at one of the hooks and the whole tip had just rolled over. It wasn't sharp at all. Yeah. So I had a file and I was just like working on it. But like you got to check your hooks, especially if you're musky fishing, when you might only get one bite a day. You want the hook to be pr like sharp the whole time. Mm -hmm. So always check your hooks. Anytime you bump into anything or it's like, oh, I got snagged on a rock, check all your hooks. <laughs> Don't not do that. Yeah. Like you have to do it, especially for musky. So files are cheap. You can get a file for what, 10 bucks? I... I ended up getting i got a cuda file okay so nice so one. they, they it, i think it cost me 25 bucks or something like that but it's a really nice like a really nice file really nice edge super easy to sharpen the hook it's got a groove built into it i know some of them do as well but you can get a super sharp edge on yeah. that file and it's got a, a few extra mini tools with it as well so that that's one that i use um i've i in the past i just had a small like honing stone that i would use uh but to get an actual hook file is the way to go it's yeah. so much easier to actually get them get them sharp again for sure so that was a very interesting interesting fishing fact before we get on to our main topic of no rating Aww. okay your rating was <laughs> fine get it because fine point <laughs> leave the puns to me jesse <laughs> okay so before we get into our frigid fall fishing we would like to mention that we do have a Patreon account. We get a lot of people message us saying that they love the podcast a lot. Uh, you, We do have a lot of expenses that come up with the podcast. We do have a few people on, on Patreon that are helping us to cover the expenses. Most of the expenses are still being covered by me and Andrew. Mm -hmm. So if you would like this show to continue on uh, as a weekly show in season two, we are going to need the, the cost to be covered. So if you would like to help out, definitely check out our Patreon. It's only $2 a month. Mm -hmm. So if that's something that you are interested in, I will link that below in the show notes. So for frigid fall fishing, I thought we could talk about three fall fishing opportunities for the average angler. And all three of these options can be 
um, fished by shore anglers. So I know like all, you know, you pick up a fishing magazine, you watch a fishing show and they're like, oh, it's great being a fall fisherman and they're out in a hundred thousand dollar boat in the middle of like, you know, Lake Simcoe or out on the St. Lawrence fishing for big smallmouth or muskets. Like, yeah, that's cool. But the average angler, that's not an opportunity. Mm -hmm. You can't say like, oh, the average guy is going to have all this, you know, expensive gear and driving, you know, all these hours to get to this lake to fish for these trophy fish. Like, yeah, that would be nice. But or, or you're spending 800 bucks to go with a charter, which is a great opportunity, but, but expensive. It's, it's still not cheap. And this podcast is all about being an average angler. So we're going to talk about some opportunities that won't cost you a dime. <laughs> well, maybe some gas money. Except to get for there. a pristine jerk base test he's going to show you in a bit, but yeah. So here's my other pun, my other pun. If you don't own a boat, don't worry. Fall may be cold, but shore fishing can be hot. <laughs> anyway, so we're going to discuss a few different fish. So I'll give you a little teaser right now. So the first mm -hmm. one is largemouth bass. Mm -hmm. Okay. The second one is northern pike. And the third one is steelhead, Ooh. or as we like to call them, rainbow trout. <laughs> <laughs> Lake so, run steelhead. Yes. So another time uh, that another fish that is really good to fish for in the fall is musky. Mm -hmm. And you may think, oh, you should talk about musky. Well, you obviously didn't listen to our podcast two weeks ago, which was all about fall fishing for musky. <laughs> so if you want to check out that podcast, I'll leave the link below. We did a whole episode, 30 musky tips for episode 30 of our podcast, which was fall musky madness. From, from, from some professional guys. It's yeah. not just our take on it too. Really good episode. So we're going to talk about largemouth bass. So if you're a small craft angler like us, kayak, canoe, shore angler, you oftentimes find yourself in the summer targeting fish in shallow water. Mm -hmm. Shallow water, largemouth bass, it's so fun. You're fishing lily pads, slop, shallow weeds. You're fishing, you know, weedless frogs, jigs, Texas rigs, and it's fun. They may not be the biggest fish of all time, but <laughs> it is certainly a fun way to catch fish, especially on like a topwater frog. Now, what happens in the summertime they're all shallow but what happens usually you know there's always that point if you fish bass a lot and you're fishing throughout the summer and then all of a sudden it starts getting colder and then all of a sudden you get to that point where you're like it's really slowing down like there, there's not a lot of fish in this area or maybe they're just not biting well i'll tell you what they're not just not biting they're not there anymore <laughs> <laughs> so as the water gets colder and the days get shorter what happens the, the weeds die mm -hmm. and what happens with that andrew talked about this a bit on the last podcast Yes, yeah, so the weeds, they start releasing carbon dioxide as they rot underwater. And what will happen is from the base of the food chain, it starts to become stagnant. So there's there's no weeds there. You're not going to have the uh, the small you know invertebrates and stuff like that feeding. They've all either hatched or, or they've buried themselves in the mud. So they're not feeding on any live plants. The minnows and small forage fish aren't feeding on those things. And therefore, your predatory fish have nothing to feed on either. So there's nothing to hold anything in those dying weeds. Exactly. So bass stop using these shallow weeds as cover. That's not to be said that you can't catch bass in the shallows. Sometimes these floating dead weeds float into mats and sometimes mm -hmm. the bass will use those as cover. But generally speaking, mm -hmm. and there's always exceptions to the rule, <laughs> dead weeds don't hold bait fish yep. because there's the, you know, the whole food chain is not there. So they're gone. So the bass you know, there's less weeds there, so there's less ambush spots. Largemouth, they're ambush feeders. They like to hide in weeds or hide behind docks or behind sticks and logs or any anything in the water, literally like a tire. They like <laughs> hiding behind stuff. And then as food swims by, they ambush. But when the weeds all die... That's not an endorsement to throw tires in, in lakes. Yeah, don't do that, guys. I don't understand how I always see tires in lakes. I, like middle of the lake, why is there a tire? I'm trying to create bass habitat. Just kidding. Just <laughs> You heard so, it here first. <laughs> there's less ambush spots for these fish. And largemouth, again, they're, they're ambush feeders. So where do these fish go? Well, the shallows are deserted and they're devoid of life. So the, the fish, they're obviously not there. You may think, oh, they're just not biting, like we said. So the main thing that you're going to look for this time of year, including, including for musky fishing, is you're going to want to find weeds because mm -hmm. they still like weeds. They, they love weeds. Bass love living in weeds. So you got to find those weeds. Now, if you're fishing from shore, this may be a little more difficult, okay? Mm -hmm. If you're in a small boat or a kayak or even a, a bigger boat, you're going to want to find green weeds. And you can find green weeds late into the year, late into fall, like October, November even. You can still find them. So shallow weeds, they're the first weeds to die and the bass leave. But oftentimes you can find healthy green weeds uh, well into late fall. Instead of looking in, you know, 
two to five feet of water, you're going to be looking in like eight to 15 feet of water. And mm -hmm. it depends on your body of water. The clearer bodies of water grow weeds deeper because the sun can penetrate further down into the water. So you may find green weeds in seven feet of water. You may find them in 15 feet of water. And if you're fishing from shore, just grab a deep diving crankbait with treble hooks and cast around and you'll hook into something. And it's probably going to be weeds. <laughs> yeah. That's actually one way we find weeds a lot is yeah. when we pull them off of our hooks. Yeah. Now, depending on your lake, you may be able to see these with your own eyes with a you know good pair of polarized sunglasses. You can look down and see green weeds. Um, but if that's if you're in a boat, you can look down. But if you're fishing from shore, oftentimes you can use a castable fish finder. That's something that we personally haven't used. Mm -hmm. But you see those castable fish finders and you can actually find weeds. Now, you won't be able to tell what color they are, but you can find the weeds and then you can cast a bait out and snag some of the weeds and see if they're green. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one technique. <laughs> so anyway, another reason that bass go deeper this time of year is because deeper water is less affected by quick temperature changes than shallow water mm -hmm. is. So often in the fall, you'll notice that the morning is very cold, like very cold. There's frost, right? Yeah, I'm putting on a hoodie. Yeah. And then by the afternoon, it's like 22 degrees. And yeah. I back to like a t-shirt. Exactly. Which is, you know, another good reason for wool love merino wool. Oh, yeah. Because it's like, it's breathable. So it's like, okay, in the morning, <laughs> it's freezing. So you're warm. And then as soon as the sun comes out, you're like, holy crap, it's so hot. Oh, good. I don't have to take off this because I'm wearing a base layer. <laughs> so we'll talk more about that after. But the shallow water can get surprisingly cold this time of year. And fish don't like that. They don't like random temperature swings. Mm -hmm. They like things to be more stable. So what is some of the ways that you can catch some of these fish that are in deeper weeds? So we're, me and Andrew, we're gonna, we have some lures up on the table here. Yeah. And we're going to talk about some of the ways that we personally have caught bass in deeper weeds. And we're, we're going to talk about a little bit about shore fishing and a little mm -hmm. bit about fishing out of uh, my canoe. A few years ago, that something that we did in the fall. So, one way to catch weed or to find fish that are in weeds is one way to catch weeds <laughs> is just to cast a lure out. <laughs> but one way to find fish, if you find green weeds, is to find the weed line. Yes. So, what is a weed line, Andrew? So, weed line is the defined edge, preferably a defined edge, of where the weeds stop growing. So that you have access then to the full depth of that water column without having weeds where you're casting, but still within striking range from anything sitting in those weeds. Yeah. And it may not be like a completely definite edge. Mm -hmm. Like that sometimes basically you never, it's sometimes you see to it, find that. but sometimes yeah. it'll just be thick weeds. And then yeah. all of a sudden it just starts to, you know, thin out. thin out. And then it's just like sand bottom or mud bottom. Mm -hmm. So that edge that may be in deeper water this time of year, that is the ambush spot. Bass will hide in the weeds or they'll cruise along this edge looking for bait fish that are you know lost or, or in schools around these mm -hmm. these weeds or maybe the bait fish are in the weeds and they're coming in through exactly so some of our favorite ways to catch these fish again we love fishing shallow water largemouth but fishing deeper water is really fun too so one of my favorite baits is a spinner bait mm -hmm. for bass and i really like spinner bait like we're big chatterbait fans really yes. big and you can fish a chatterbait deeper but a spinner bait does a slightly better job in my opinion of getting deeper and Actually, here's two, two spinner baits. So the one Andrew has in his hand, it's actually the Freedom Tackle Speed Freak. That's the best spinner bait, the, the one spinner bait this year that I had the best success on. It's the compact size. It's white. It's got a really weird blade design that has just like a really unique Random design. Random cut edge. Like it's not, yeah. it's, um, it's asymmetrical yeah. blade design. So it has a very weird, unique vibration i guess you could say now the speed freak was actually designed to be burned for small with bass but you can use it in any situation really but a spinner bait is just a fantastic tool for the job another one i have here is uh it's from our sponsor last week jacked up jigs he's a spinner bait here now we talked about this a little bit last time but you may notice that this spinner bait the blades are thinner mm -hmm. thinner blades these willow leaf blades they're not really big ones they produce less lift so you can actually fish them deeper so if you're someone like me that reels fast and your bait is way up near the surface, the fish are down deep. We're talking, we're fishing in eight to, eight to 15 feet of water. So you want your bait to get down. So that's one thing that'll help you for someone like me that reels in fast. So spinner baits are great. Yeah. And, and like you just said, uh, there are lots of spinner bait options out there, but for a general rule of thumb is the same weight spinner bait will ride lower if it has willow leaf blades, so a longer thin blade than it has those 
big round blades, which I think are called what the Colorado blades. Colorado blades, yeah, are the big round ones that might be what you're used to. But if you want to get deeper, you can have the same weight of spinner bait, same manufacturer, but because of that blade difference, the longer blades sit tighter to the to the shank as they spin, so there's less lift in the water. Yeah, and if you do want to use bigger blades for more flash and vibration, just use a heavier spinner bait. Mm-hmm. I like a half ounce spinner bait as an overall, but I'll go up to three quarter ounce if I want to slow roll a big double willow leaf just deep. And what you want to do is find that weed line or, or sparse weeds around that weed line and then just start fan casting and try different depths. Try slow rolling it right along the bottom. Try fishing it two or three feet off the bottom. Mm-hmm. If there's bass in that area and they're feeding, they're going to smash it. It's also a super good lure for pike, but we're going to talk about that too. <laughs> So that's the first one is spinner baits. Chatter baits, I'd work them pretty much the same way. Mm-hmm. It's a slightly different presentation. So if they're not hitting spinner baits, try, try a chatter bait. Another one is um, jigs. And we talked a lot about fall fishing for jigs last week. So we're not really going to get into it this week. If you want to check that podcast out, Andrew went into like a whole bunch of different <laughs> jigs. But they are fantastic. They're great for fishing deep water. You can put anything on them, paddle tail, craw beaver you can fish them however you want fish them however you want they all catch fish another great way to catch them is on a swim bait just like a plastic swim bait here i just got the storm uh i think these are called the what search bait 360 yeah the 360 yeah this is just the four and a half inch one i've also caught fish on the five and a half inch one actually a story quickly we were fishing (laughs) late october last year on this little bay and we were fishing deep weeds I think like eight or nine feet of water, just like thick mill foil. Still green and it was still thick. Still green and thick, even in late October. And we were basically just dropping jigs down the hole and just jigging them around. I was, I I wasn't fishing a jig per se. I was fishing a swim bait, but I was kind of swimming it up and down through the hole. Mm -hmm. And I caught some really nice fish that day. In fact, one pretty chunky bass the biggest one that we caught in that area over the years in fact you weren't even fishing at the time your rod is just sitting on your lap yeah across your legs with the bait like three inches into the water and it happened to be sitting in a hole yeah and I, and I as the back, boat drifted over yeah, this... i turned back to look at jesse and i'm like jesse look and i pointed at this like bass just had this big uh gt search bait right middle of his mouth this big what was it the six inch or the eight inch it was the big like the five and yeah. a half inch yeah, yeah. it was a big one <laughs> And the thing just came up and ate. Like, it's kind of as the boat was slowly drifting, the, the swim bait was just kind of slowly going through the hole. And this fish just came up and grabbed it and just sat there with yeah. the bait half yeah. sticking out of its mouth. <laughs> and then I just set the hook and boom, chunky fish, <laughs> fall fish, really good. So another bait, we're going to talk about that one for pike though. So don't ruin it now. Okay. But swim baits are great. Forget you saw that. Yeah. And again, this time of year, you can do well on smaller presentations, but you have to remember these fish are eating up for the fall. So don't be afraid to chuck even for bass, like, you know, four or five, six inch baits Mm -hmm. they're feeding up don't worry about it they'll they'll take it um the next bait that we really like is jerk baits jerk baits are good in the fall especially when the water temps gets really cold because again andrew talked about this last week these fish they're they're feeding up for the winter but their metabolism is so slow these Mm -hmm. fish are like they have to be lazy their body doesn't produce its own heat so when the water gets cold they get sluggish they have no choice they can move fast if they have to, but generally speaking, they're just chilling. Mm-hmm. And like a jerk bait is one of the best cold water baits for any species because it's it attracts fish from a long distance away. They've got a lot of them have rattles, mm-hmm. you know. A lot of them have like this one here is a jackal re-range, which is my favorite jerk bait of all yeah. time. It's got flat sides, so it throws off a lot of flash. And then as you're jerking them through the water, just attracting the attention of any fish in the area. When you pause that bait and it just suspends there like mm-hmm. a dead minnow, fish just slowly swims up. It's like, oh, it's not even moving. I'm just going to go up and eat that. And as you jerk it forward again, the fish just reacts and, and hits it. The reaction bite is huge in the fall because if these fish are really lackadaisical, you can actually just force them to bite. Just be like, yep. oh, reaction bite. You're going to yep. bite. I think the main thing in bass fishing and other fishing is when, when humans realize that you could just basically make a fish bite just by <laughs> making it react. That was a game changer. Yes. It's all the most famous lures out there that are just like like half the jigs. Just, just drop a jig in front of the fish and it grabs it. And then people realize like they're biting it because it's a reaction. It's like if someone throws a baseball at you and you're just like, oh, I can catch it. Yeah. That's what bass do. And bass react big time to jerk baits. I was going to mention, like, just to illustrate it. If you ever, like Jesse and I, we played guitar in the past. Uh, Jesse still does. And we were, we played it in the 
before we had like a like a fall dance or something we're playing outside and just with some fall temperatures like it gets hard to start doing those chords your fingers start stiffening up and it gets tough to play guitar just because it's it's very um not finesse but it's technical yeah to, to do it but at the same time if someone throws a brick at you you can catch it before it hits your head so Hopefully. <laughs> you're still going to react so you can you know you can still work all winter long on a cold so the same thing with these fish yes it's cold uh their their motor systems are, are slowing down again it's not that they're incapable of it but it just becomes uh, it, they prefer not to have to, to move as little as possible because it is more exerting to do those movements. Exactly. And another really good bait is crankbaits. And mm-hmm. it's kind of the same thing as a spinner bait. You're just going to cast that around, you know, rocks, weed edges, stuff like that, and just reel it in. And crankbaits a lot of the time are also a reaction bite too because this thing's it blisters by their head and they're like, mm-hmm. they just grab it. And especially if you're fishing from shore, a square square bill crankbait is some of the best things you can throw because again with the fall there's less weeds for those treble hooks to get caught on if you're fishing especially like around a weed edge where there's rock or or even if there's timber you can fish it's amazing what a square bill crankbait will get through it's yeah. probably the least snaggable um another good one is a lipless crank you'd be surprised at how much stuff you can knock those off of without them getting snagged yeah so it's a really good option for shore casting to kind of stick to in my preference to stick to those two because in the fall your option of going and swimming after it isn't there and it can be tough to retrieve a bait so take take ones that have the least chance of getting snagged for you yeah because we've all been there fishing from shore and you snag your bait and you can't get it it'll still happen you can it happens yeah but you want to use lures that aren't prone to snagging yes (laughs) so from a boat again you you do have advantage fishing from a boat or a kayak because then you can actually drift over these weeds and drop your bait down into holes So very quickly, if you're fishing from shore, areas that I would target, a lot of lakes have like piers or or jetties that go out into the lake. Um, A lot of times they're near marinas and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Go off these piers. And again, if you're going to be there, fish everything, but you're going to want to be targeting slightly deeper water. So don't fish around, you know, the edges where there's lily pads and stuff. There may be some fish there, but as it gets really cold in the fall, try casting out a little bit further. Again, try that eight to 15 foot depth and Try all the same baits that we talked about: spinner baits, jerk baits, um, swim baits. It's mm-hmm. all it's all basic fishing. Doesn't have to be complicated. Just throw it a good presentation, work the water, and make sure you're fishing down at the right depth, and you'll mm-hmm. definitely catch fish. And another thing too, if you're fishing, if you want to fish on top of the weeds, because uh, sometimes from shore you don't have a lot of selection. If you're fishing from shore, you might not be able to cast along a weed line because uh, that transition happens generally from the shallow to the deep water. So sometimes you have to fish you know, through the weeds, which again, we talked about a spinnerbait is really good for that. A swim jig, a uh, chatterbait can work well, depending on, on on how thick the weeds are. You know, a swim, swim bait, that can work well. Another thing that you can do is if you can fish above the weeds, the slow presentation. So things like a wake bait. There's a, I think the, the BX Balsa wake bait from uh, Rapala. I really like that thing. It's a big minnow bait. It looks... Very similar to the jerk baits in its in its profile, but it's just got a, a very short lip to pointing almost directly down. And you can work that thing. You can even twitch it if you want. You can kind of fish it similar to a jerk bait, and you can let it pause. So the big thing, if you are going to fish in the top of the water column, I would say it's a good idea to keep it very slow. And the bass I caught last year, I caught on it's a top water. Uh, it's the the piku piku, and I caught that it was a, a top water minnow bait, and I cast out and I just let it. It's the whole thing with that is you let it sit. You twitched a bit, you let it sit. And because I knew there was a fish there, I was targeting. I, I knew that the fish would be holding there. I could target that specific area. And they just need time to come up and inspect it. But you think they're opportunistic feeders. They're not going to chase it. But if there's a minnow floating above them, they're going to hit it. They're going to come up and they can take that still. So that is another option for fishing above the weeds if that's what you're limited to with me in your casting range yeah because again you're fishing from shore you don't have the big options as someone that's in a boat but give those fish time to get up to the top of that water column yeah because top water is not maybe not the best presentation as the water gets really cold but you can catch fish on top waters fairly late in the year later than you generally expect especially musky fishing so i thought we'd take a minute now before we get into the next one which is northern pike which is one of my favorite fish to talk about our episode sponsor will love apparel now 
they've generously actually donated 75 bucks not cash you got to use it on the website <laughs> <laughs> but uh we will do a draw on our instagram so the only way to win these these uh draws is to go on our instagram watch for the giveaway post that is the same week that the podcast is released and uh, make sure you turn on your post notifications so you can be one of the first ones to enter because the giveaways generally are only one or two days and then they're gone mm -hmm. i get a lot of people message me like how do i enter the giveaway i'm like it's done yeah that was last week so make sure you follow us on instagram to do that so we're pretty picky with who we partner up for our, our podcast episode sponsors but i thought because we're doing a frigid fall fishing episode which requires you know mm -hmm. you know warm clothing we learned a long time ago me and andrew that comfort is essential exactly for cold this. weather yeah. <laughs> he knows and it's essential for cold water fishing but also just any outdoor activities in general so i just thought we could talk about some of the products that we'll love apparel has that would be great for anyone but we're generally going to talk about the average angler mm -hmm. in the fall so wouldn't you agree that one of the worst things ever is when your feet get cold yeah absolutely it's one of the worst things that ever sent, had it sent me home from ice fishing <laughs> way more times than i'd like to admit yeah so i was i was saying the same thing like we we went through a phase where like we, we, you know, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. So like when we went ice fishing, we just had cheap boots mm -hmm. and like, you know, we'd, we'd wear like, you know, three or four pairs of socks and like, we get out there and be like, yeah, this isn't bad. And then three hours later, we're like, I can't feel my toes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, we'd go home and just be like, I think my toes have to be chopped off, but I still have all mine. <laughs> have we... I have most of mine. <laughs> oh, that's okay. So eventually we ended up buying some really nice boots and, and some nice socks and stuff. And now it's, it's such a game changer. You're fishing out there all day long and you don't even think about your toes. Mm -hmm. Like they're warm. I got boots that are like good to minus 80 or something. I, I, I have some decent boots, but I need, I need better ones still. Yeah. Yeah. And you always need more, need quadruple the rating what you think you do. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So that's definitely one of the worst things ever is just being uncomfortable and cold when you're out fishing or in the outdoors. So Wool Love has the perfect solution, which we already talked about, Merino, Merino Wool. And they have Merino Wool socks, mm -hmm. which is, again, there's many benefits. We're going to talk about them in a sec. So Merino, one of the main things that is good about it is it's moisture wicking. Now, I have a lot of like outdoor clothes too. And like whenever you get something that's moisture wicking, it makes you feel so cool instead of yeah. not cool. Like I'm a cool guy, but like <laughs> you put it on in the summer and you're like, oh, why is this shirt chilly? Like, yeah, because it pulls the sweat away from your body, which yeah. is exactly what you want. You don't just want your shirt to soak up the sweat and then just like hold it on your body because yeah. then it feels uncomfortable. So Merino that, wool. That turns into a wetsuit and wetsuits are designed to hold heat to you. <laughs> yeah. So Merino wool, it's moisture wicking. It's breathable because you also want things to be breathable. Yes. If something's not breathable, like I had this old raincoat and you put that thing on and you're sweating <laughs> under that thing. It's like, yeah. oh my goodness, I'm yeah. dying because it's not, it wasn't a breathable one. So it's moisture wicking, it's breathable. And of course it's very warm because it's wool. So even if you're doing an activity that gets you sweating a bit, uh, your feet stay warm, they stay dry. Think of ice fishing. You're going out there and you're like, you know, it's going to be freezing cold, but you got to pull the hut all the way out. You're going to pull your sled mm -hmm. and you're going to be sweating. Mm -hmm. And once you get there, you're all sweaty and then the cold kicks in and makes you even colder. You don't want that. Yeah, you, want, you want some wool of merino wool that is moisture wicking, pulls the sweat away from you, fast drying, dries quick, but yet it still keeps you warm. Yes, because... When people get, um, oh crap, I forgot what it's called. Uh, hypothermia. Hypothermia. Like hypothermia is something that it can kick in at low, lower temperatures than you think. Like this temperature right now that we're experiencing in the fall, and it still gets to 22 degrees. Like that's one of the the highest times for deaths due to hypothermia in people like around the woods and stuff like that because they don't think that it's that much of a danger. But like Jesse says, you start sweating. If your clothes aren't equipped to get rid of that sweat, your sweat then, as soon as the temperature drops, you're now freezing because that water gets, all that sweat gets ice cold. Now you're at risk of hypothermia. It doesn't have to be below freezing. It just has to be cooler. I think it's like 14 degrees you can get hypothermia. Hmm. Something like that. It's That's crazy. It's, it's warmer than you think. So having the right equipment, having the right clothing that you're equipped to be in the outdoors, to be in that situation, you know you're going to get sweaty. You know you're going to have the colder temperatures. You want to have that ready. Exactly. And also I was thinking, I was like, Merino wool, isn't that itchy and scratchy? It's not. <laughs> no. Merino wool is silky smooth. Yeah. Silky smooth. So you don't have to worry about, you know, oh, I'm dry and warm, but I'm itching like I have fleas. It's it's not that like uh, salmon pink 
like wool blanket that has your like, grandpa's cottage. Yeah, that that has like that shiny trim edge. You all know the one I'm talking about. <laughs> So Wool Love also makes leggings, base layers, long sleeve shirts, boxer briefs. And there's one thing that caught my eye. I was showing Andrew earlier. They have a quarter zip base layer and hoodies, Mm -hmm. which for me, I'm always wearing a hoodie when I'm fishing. It's one of my layers for sure. So especially the hoodie, because I love hoodies. I'm sure most of us have tons of them, right? So when you fish in the fall, sometimes, like we said, the sun comes out and you know you're cold in the morning and all of a sudden the sun comes out and it's like 25 degrees and you're like oh and you just start sweating so mm-hmm. the fact that you can have a quarter zip zip it down let some air breathe you know let some air flow into your you know chesticle area <laughs> it's amazing so you don't overheat <laughs> they sell men's and women's clothing of all types and uh, if you want to check it out their website um, definitely we'll leave the link below in our show notes mm-hmm. and one thing i would like to mention too is they actually gave us a promo code for this podcast and it's uh well it's aoa 15 but i'll Ooh. link that below down below and you can get 15 percent off your order ah. if you don't win the giveaway if you win the giveaway you'll get 75 dollars. but if you don't you still want to order some of the stuff because it's good stuff yeah we know tons of people that use it um aoa 15 15 off all right and if you do buy something make sure you mention that we sent you because that helps <laughs> us get uh, sponsorships in the future as well so we're going to talk about pike now. Pike is one of my favorite fish. I know it's one of Andrew's favorite yep. fish. I know a lot of people are like hating on pike, but pike are fun. <laughs> I actually like I, catching yeah. pike. And a big pike, big people pike. People hate pike because they're like, oh, I want to go for walleye. And pike are there and they bite me off. Or I want to go for yeah. bass. And the pike they bite me off. Or I want to catch muskie, but I'm catching stupid pike. Like, yeah. But they're the always people, there when you don't yeah. want them. It's pretty rare to find a guy who's like, I'm a pike fisherman. Like, they are around, but it's pretty rare to find a guy who's in like Europe all about pike. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you have to think pike, big pike, the small mm-hmm. pike. They can, you know, they're all over the shallows in the summer, but mm-hmm. big pike like colder water. Yes, they, they love are it. a cold water fish. Exactly. They're more like lake trout than bass. Yeah. So during the summer, oftentimes you only catch small pike in the shallows because all those big fat girls they slip back down into the deep water and they can be caught in pretty deep water. They're down in deep main lake structure, deep weed edges. Mm-hmm. You won't even find them in the shells. Maybe the, rarely. The only way you will generally is if there's a spring fed creek or an underwater spring with like super cold water, they'll hold around there. But it's because they want that colder temperature and generally in any lake, the shallows, they warm up way too much for a big pike. And the reason why the small ones are there is because yes, they're, they're small pike. They're there for the foragers. So there's food there. But they also don't want to get eaten still. Yeah. So they're there for protection as well. So as we discussed with bass, when the weeds start to decay in the shallows, obviously the bait fish and the bass even, which, you know, pike eat bass as well. They eat walleye, they eat bass. They Mm -hmm. eat anything that fits in their mouth. All that (laughs) stuff is gone from the shallows. Up to a third of their length they can eat. That's crazy, right? So you have to think, as soon as all these things leave the shallows, they're like, ah, I'm out of here. There's nothing, you know, nothing's going on. They, they go slightly deeper, like we said, 8 to 15 feet. Mm-hmm. Depending on your lake, it could be different. Those pike are there waiting. Mm-hmm. They know. When it when it starts getting cold in the morning, like we talked about in the musky podcast, when it starts getting cold in the morning and you start after wearing a hoodie in the morning, those fish are already putting on the feed bag. They know yeah. winter's coming. Yeah. It's like every time they blink their eyes, if they can blink, they're just like, they see like the snow and the ice. They're like, dear Lord, I need to start eating food, <laughs> right? And these big pike, like we said, in the summer, they've been in the deeper water. So right now in the fall, they're feeding on all these other, you know, fish that are moving into the deep. They, they have the pike already their residence <laughs> and they're just now having this, this boon of food come right to them. Yeah. So it's a great place to catch anything yep. like these areas that we're talking about. You can catch, you know, one cast of pike, one cast of bass. Like it yep. could be anything because all these, these fish are all fish that are, predators follow the bait yes so wherever the bait is that's where the other fish are going to be and again you're not fishing a lake that has only one species in it like some lakes you know there's a few lakes we fish that don't have pike they they literally just have bass and literally that's it yeah and there's some lakes we fish that are just walleye and just bass there's Mm -hmm. nothing else but some lakes have everything in them Mm -hmm. like one of our favorite lakes we fish it has tons of smallmouth tons of largemouth tons of pike the odd muskie so you never know what you're going to catch, which is exciting. Wally. Yeah, there's everything. <laughs> yeah. So it's a crazy. So you follow the bait. And as we talked about going, you're fishing, weed edges are always a hot spot. Mm-hmm. But other places, say you're fishing a lake and you're like, you know, we don't have a lot of weeds. Because like we fish down by Lake Ontario, a lot of the Kortha lakes are just choked with weeds. But if you drive up north, that's not the case. 
So you may think, oh, these guys are insane. I, I can't find weed edges. There's no weeds here. So these are some other places that can be good. Uh, rocky points, mm -hmm. steep, um, like steep points, steep edges, ledges, and um, main lake humps. Mm -hmm. So the reasons for that is that's where bait fish are going to congregate. Bait fish are going to congregate on these steep points, these humps. Think of like in a big basin, if there's big schools of bait fish, and then there's all of a sudden, they say 20, 30 feet, and all of a sudden there's like a, a hump that comes up 10 feet. Mm -hmm. Those fish are going to congregate on that because it's different. Yes. Fish are not intelligent. They like to hang out on different things. You've all seen that illustration of like they put a bunch of bass in a swimming pool and they're all just swimming around and then they put one rock on the side and then all the bass go to that side. Yep. And then they or put they like, have a shadow on. They have a right. shadow on one side. All the bass go there. Shadow. They did one where they literally painted a black line, and all the yep. bass went. They just like to relate to things that are yep. different. So find something that's different. So if your lake is round and there's one part that just juts out, just like a big point, mm -hmm. fish are gonna are gonna gravitate to that point. Mm -hmm. So definitely check those areas out. So if you're fishing these slightly deeper pike, there's a lot of really really cool lures that you can use. But again, you don't have to get crazy. Just basic lures. And we're going to start off with literally the same one as bass. Spinner baits are yeah. one of my favorite pike lures all, all year. Love them. And like I mentioned last year, this jacked up jig spinner bait, this one here, it's black and orange. <laughs> it's like a Halloween spinner bait, right? And it's got, you know, it's got some nice brass blades on it. But what I'm going to do on that is I'm going to put, no joke, just a big black Mr. Twister four yep. or five inch just on the back have a big twister i find for pike the trailer doesn't really matter so i just put a big twister tail on yep. that no problem and a spinner bait i'm just going to work that at a moderate retrieve just along the weeds or just along any point like that and spinner baits catch anything mm -hmm. bass pike musky walleye cut walleye on them i find that spinner baits outproduce chatter baits in the fall uh swim jigs is another one too like that uh, generally has a it has a weed guard uh you can retrieve it through those weeds easy and again, like I know last year or a couple of years ago, Jesse, I was using chatter baits and generally they, I kill, I kill pike on chatter baits. Yeah. But Jesse was outperforming me left and right by casting out swim jigs. So even just swim jigs, spinner baits, something with perhaps a little bit less like of an aggressive vibration might be really good to use in the fall as well. But again, judge it by the day. Sometimes they're still be super active and super uh, aggressive, but don't be afraid to start changing, you know, from those, yes, pike are cold water. That is their prime habitat that they're feeding in right now. But don't be afraid to be a little slower. Because if you're trying to mimic what they're feeding on, uh, you think of the rest of the fish, that's not their prime water. They are slower now. All the game fish, the bait fish are slower. Because, the, again, like we talked about, colder water temperatures are cold-blooded. They're not moving as quick as normal. So your presentations can become a bit more not downsized but just more finesse in their approach mm -hmm. another really good pike lure that is good all year round is just a spoon spinners yep. and spoons i'm i'm more of a spoon guy than a spinner guy myself this is a classic this is the len thompson number two you know five of diamonds you can't beat that yeah. i mean like any of the classic pike patterns like you know you got the len thompson you got the daredevils uh, Mep cyclops williams wobbler any spoon yep. like that it's such a simple lure to use cast it out let it flutter down whatever depth you want to fish and just reel it in. It's easy. Great bait for fishing from shore as well. Mm -hmm. Spinners are great too. Um, another lure, like we talked about jerk baits, pike love jerk baits. They, they feed on minnows. That's yep. their main forage is bait fish. So if you have a bait like this here, this is a bougie one, but this is a Nishini Erie one five or one fifteen, which is, it's slightly bigger. It's about five inches long, big minnow imitator like that. Jackal rearrange. We got the evergreen here. Mm -hmm. uh, classic Rapala Husky Jerk Fire Tiger. Yep. If I could only have one jerk bait for pike, that'd probably be it. Such a good lure. Yep. Another I really like the X wrap personally. I do really well in the X wraps. I like the X wrap, but I find you have. To, I like the bigger one. Yep. The regular size bass one in the fall. Another one that I've really got attached to is the Yozuri 3DB jerk baits. They're like ten bucks and they catch good fish. And the hooks are sharp too. So like any, basically any minnow, minnow imitator is really good. Mm -hmm. Another one that I'm really excited to try this fall. I picked some of these up at uh, the spring fishing show is the perfect jig came out with these six inch thin swimmer. So I find a lot of the bigger six inch baits. They're very high. They're mm -hmm. very like, you know, thick. 
This is his thin swimmer. It's obviously a little thinner and it's, it's a great bait. What I have here is a five watt flashy swimmer. It's got a little willow leaf blade underneath that. This is a white swim bait with a, a chartreuse tail. It doesn't have a crazy like back and forth wobbling action. It's just perfect. It's right in the middle. It has a nice roll to it. Something like that for pike. That's literally, that's pike candy right there. Yeah. And it's weedless. So you can cast it through those weeds. So if you're fishing from shore, the same bait supply. Areas that I would try to fish from shore for pike that can be good. Marinas. Oftentimes mm -hmm. the pike will come into these marinas in the fall following you know, bait fish or like as the water cools, they're like, okay, these areas aren't warm anymore. I can, I can check out this area. We've caught some really big pike in marinas. Yeah. Um, off piers near marinas or river mouths can be good. Again, a lot of these lakes, uh, I would say if, if you're fishing from shore, a good spot to fish is bridges. Any, anywhere where the lake bottlenecks down to a certain area, usually bridges, they chuck a lot of rocks in the water. Yep. Like there's lots of and, debris from and, when they built it. Right? Yeah, and, and boulders, it out right? wherever, and yeah. So you have all kinds of structure and oftentimes access to deeper water, which is a great spot. Those are spots that I would definitely check out yeah. and can be good for anything. Bridges attract all kinds of fish. And that's, that's the thing. You'll hear some of the guys talk about uh, like fish highways. And so as these, again, following the bait fish, it's, it's, if you want to catch a predator fish, go back up the food chain. So if you have, you know, these pike, they're in deep water, but they also, all summer long, they've been in deep water with access to shallow water. They're not moving because all these bait fish are doing is they're going from the shallow water, trying to access deep water. So it can be very close to the areas you've been catching them in the summer, just in the deeper area, in the, in the deeper section of the water. So if you have like a nice shallow bay that you do really well in, like for bass fishing and stuff like that, in the summertime and then just outside of that bay it drops down to 15 feet chances are that's that entire bay is emptying right to that deep water there's going to be a line of pike just waiting for all these fish to come down and they're going to stick around because that's uh, the fish they don't they move but most of the fish in the lake don't move around the lake they stay pretty close to an area yeah so they they again they don't want to swim as any more than they have to so if you can find these areas, if you can't catch the, the, if you've stopped catching fish in the shallows and you haven't located them yet in a deeper water, start fishing the areas where it's in between the two, these, these trenches, perhaps there's a wall where it, that's, you know, it kind of makes sense where this is where the fish would be emptying and traveling on their way to their winter grounds. Mm -hmm. So start fishing those areas. Exactly. So we're going to have to kind of rush through steelhead fishing. We have a whole episode <laughs> on steelhead fishing which I'll link below, but steelhead. So during September, salmon, everyone's fishing the creeks for salmon, whether you like that or not. I know a lot of people are, don't like salmon fishing in the creeks, but there are a lot of people that do take advantage of these giant fish mm -hmm. being in relatively shallow water and they're accessible for the first time because generally mm -hmm. they're out in like, you know, Lake Ontario or whatever lake. So salmon, they're there. They start to, you know, the run starts to slow down at the end of September. You can still catch them in October. Um, depending on where you fish, but generally at the end of September, the steelhead start coming in, mm -hmm. start coming in a little bit. I, I remember fishing with this old guy down at uh, the harbor. I used to live right beside the creek. So I used to fish steelhead like all the time, multiple, multiple days a week. And there's always this old guy fishing down at the harbor and he'd be, he'd be float fishing down at this little like pool where the river kind of started. And he'd tell me, he's like, when the, when the days start getting crappy, <laughs> say that's when the steelhead come <laughs> and like it would be it would be true as soon as you get that first like just crappy weather in, in late fall that's when the steelhead like the most of the steelhead would come up the creek i've caught them in like of the fall run of steelhead yeah i've yeah. caught them in like you know early to mid-september you'll catch the odd one but generally the, the the more of the masses of the fish come up and when the water gets a little colder and you can also catch browns this time of yeah, year too say, yeah. which is the same technique uh it's it's probably one of the best ways to catch, you know, a beautiful, big, hard fighting fish. If you don't have a boat and you want to catch a, a beautiful fish, that's, you know, possibly not a salmon, something that you may have a, a bigger sense of accomplishment catching like a steelhead to me, I'd rather catch one steelhead than, you know, 50 Chinook salmon personally, because steelhead are just, they're just beautiful fish. They take a little more skill to catch. And if that's something that you want to try, it's, it's not complicated. It does take a lot of hard work. It takes practice. It takes some finesse but they're not geniuses. I used to give steelhead way too much um, credit. Credit. They're not smart fish. They're dumb. 
the difference is you just need to find them <laughs> and you need to present a bait to them. And generally when you're fishing steelhead, especially in the, in the fall, you're so used to looking around and you see where all these dark Chinook salmon are like, Oh, there's one. You look in the pool. There's nothing there. Yeah. You won't generally won't see the steelhead in the pool unless it's like gin cleared water. But like you yeah. won't perhaps probably won't see this big black shadow sitting there. Cause these, these fish are like dime fresh silver. Yeah. So yeah, they you camouflage. oftentimes will not see them in that pool. So if you're bypassing a pool and, and like, oh, I don't see any salmon, don't see any fish in there, still still take a few drifts through that because chances are there could be a high probability of a steelhead being in there. You just can't see it yourself. Yeah, and one tip I'd give you if you are fishing these creeks, great bait to use, uh, row bags, pink worms, small flies, uh, little plastics like little maggots, stuff like mm-hmm. that, really good. One tip that I got, and it really helped me catch fish, is I would talk to guys that would fish in pools where there'd be a bunch of Chinook swimming around, and I would just be catching Chinook. And I'd be like, man, I know they're still out in here. I saw one swim into the pool. And this guy's like, you're fishing too high. It's like, fish below the Chinook. (laughs) Chinook don't generally hug the bottom like steelhead do. They are slightly off the bottom most of the times. And these steelhead, you have to think, there's all these big Chinook just bullying their way through a pool. And this this little steelhead that's only like five mm-hmm. or six pounds, it's probably in the corner at the bottom just trying to get up the pool without getting, you know, <laughs> you know, pummeled by these big fish. So fish below the Chinook, fish deep pools, fish pockets behind rocks, uh, eddies, currents, seams, stuff like that. You will catch steelhead. It's not the time of year when the most steelhead go up the creek, but those fall run steelhead are one of the best fighting fish yeah. you'll ever catch. Yeah. And I'd it, rather catch a fall steelhead than a spring one. Again, it's great any time of year, yeah. but there's something special about those fall steelhead. And another cool technique for fishing for steelhead is using hardware like spinners and spoons. I've caught some of my best fall steelhead actually on uh, spinners. So it's, it's a fun way. And you know what? You'll smash the odd Chinook that'll just rocket through the pool and hit <laughs> it or a coho. So it's always like a good, a good, uh, you know, technique to try if you want to catch anything. Now, one thing I will warn you, I do get a lot of people ask me, they're like, Hey, where do I fish for, you know, steelhead or salmon in the creeks at the end of September, a lot of the creeks close. You can't fish them above a certain point. So make sure you mm-hmm. check your regulations because after September 30th or whatever, the last Saturday in September, whatever that is the upper creeks close you cannot fish them for mm-hmm. salmon or steelhead some of the lower sections are open year round those sections can still be very productive mm-hmm. and generally i know a lot of people are like any fishing in the creek is snagging fish usually those are people that don't actually fish the creeks and don't know what they're talking about so we're talking about these big deep holes at the lower sections of the creek that have steelhead they may have some salmon still kicking around that's fine don't mind catching a salmon once in a while but the browns and the steelies, when they come up after a good rain, that's the best yeah. time after a good rain. Fish these slow, deep holes. You can't see the bottom. You can't see fish. There's no way you're lining fish. Just be patient. Use good bait. Yep. Present it properly, and you'll eventually catch fish. And like, like we talked about in the salmon episode, you can't line steelhead. So it's very hard. Yeah, they don't. They don't hang there with their mouths open, though. So again, your odds are of of lining them. If they're gonna take the bait. They're gonna take your bait. That's how you're gonna hook them primarily. Exactly. And I think it's one of those things where there are easier things to target than steelhead in the creeks, especially if you're starting out. But the satisfaction, <laughs> the personal satisfaction you get from catching a dime silver steelhead in the fall, it's such a good feeling. You may fish days before you catch one, but when you do finally catch one, it's it's like catching a muskie. It's like that was wow. worth it, all that hard work. And it's, it's the it's most amazing. showboating fish in one of the most confined areas. And it's, it's a fight of your life. It's yeah. insane. Yeah. So anyway... I thought we could go over a few AOA Q&As. Yes. I know we're going a little over time. I'm sure you guys won't mind if we spend (laughs) maybe five minutes doing some Q&As we had you guys send in a few weeks ago. So here is one question that we will give to Andrew, and you have to answer in 20 seconds or less. Okay. Okay, so talk really fast. Ryan Smitty 94 says, what is your go-to move when things get tough? Downsize, lucky lure, stick to one? Uh, I would say... I like to downsize uh, just because if my my good lure that I really like isn't working or if other things aren't working, yeah, I have confidence in something else, but maybe there's another reason why they're not biting. So I like to downsize. Uh, I'll try and use more of a finesse approach. Yeah. So my answer to that question is, speaking of steelhead, when things get tough, um, I'm a big mover. I like moving and trying pools, but if I can find a pool that I know there's fish in and it's deep, I'm going to 
finesse the heck out of it. I'm going to mm -hmm. downsize. I might drop from an eight millimeter, eight millimeter bead down to a six millimeter bead and four pound line instead of six. I'm going to try to finesse the heck out of it to try to catch those fish that are there because there's not super a lot of spots that hold fish. So when I find a good one, I'm going to stick there, stay there, and I'm just going to try different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is actually a really good question from the morning voice. He says, what is the best smelling lure or bait out there? <laughs> Actually, I'll tell you right now. It's the stuff that Jesse gave me a little while ago. And it's the Cyberflex. There it is. The Salt Impregnated Strike King 3X Soft Baits with Cyberflex. It's garlic. Z-Man. And it smells like garlic. Yeah, oh, let that's me, let that's me smell the that. best smelling bait ever. It, it actually opinion. smells it's, like garlic bread. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. You smell it, it makes you hungry. <laughs> okay. Another really good one is the Strike King coffee. Ooh, coffee the coffee scent. tubes. They yes. Different plastics that have coffee scent on them. It smells literally like you're sniffing a Tim Hortons coffee. <laughs> so pretty much horrendous. <laughs> and my favorite though, overall, I'd have to say Berkeley, Berkeley? Power Bay. Yeah. It's so nostalgic for me. When yeah. I open that up, I always give it a good sniff and it just brings back all these like memories from when I was a kid fishing. And it, it smells rancid and disgusting, but to me, it's amazing. It smells like fishing. <laughs> yeah, it's it like, smells like yes. fishing. This is another good question, also from The Morning Voice. I had to read this one, too, because it's such a good question. He says, what's your least favorite fish to catch? That's a good question. Uh, least favorite? That's a good one. Do you have one? Do you say it while you think? This isn't my least favorite, but I'd say the fish that I catch that I get the most annoyed is, again, we're going to go back to fishing the creeks. When I'm fishing for steelhead and I hook a Chinook, that is my least favorite fish to catch at that time. Like when you hook a fish, you're like, oh, it's a steelhead. And it comes up and it's some big, dirty, old, half rotten boot. I'm like, oh, and you're mm. just like, come on, come on. You're just trying to pop the hook out of it. Yeah. I would say for me, it's. I like catching all fish. Yeah. Though. Like, you know, it's it's not even like I like catching sunfish. I'm not going to say sunfish. I love catching sunfish. I, I'd probably have to say it's it's chub. Because when I'm going for like stream trout and then I catch all I'm catching is like creek chub it's like okay I'm, I'm here for a prettier looking fish <laughs> yeah true um here's a good question from blue minnow adventures he says what are your thoughts with uh live scope or active target i was just talking to him online actually yeah yeah so he's uh, he did his own boat build so um i if i can if you can afford it get it like i i have no thoughts if you're asking in, in tournaments or whatever whatever on that side of it i don't view it as cheating because everyone has technology we we use technology and just because it's the newest stuff and someone else can't afford it doesn't mean that person who can is cheating they're using the best gear they can get yeah so, i used to be really against it but after fishing in a boat with someone <laughs> i fished with my buddy paul the other day and he has live scope and i was like again i grew up really poor i don't know like we don't have big boats yeah so when i see some technology that costs like five thousand dollars i'm like I, you know you kind of get your you know your mm -hmm. back up a little bit like oh yeah you don't need that expensive stuff it is super cool yeah. i'm not gonna lie it's super cool if you and it can be very useful yeah if you're fishing and you have some technology that will help you catch more fish then that's amazing yeah. now will it impact the the fishery in a bad way i don't know maybe it will i don't know i'm not like a biologist or a, yeah. you know someone with all that's those stats. The thing. you can take anything and misuse it right yeah so like for me I would, I, it is my plan to eventually have forward facing sonar of some sort on my boat, which right. I have a tinner, it's cheap, but I'm saving up. I'm putting my money into the electronics because I can take those onto any other boat that I want to get in the future. Yeah. So if I have 15 grand of electronics on a $2,000 boat setup, I don't care because I can take those electronics off on the next one. That's yeah. where I want to put my money because that's, once I'm now on the water, the stuff is going to help me catch more fish, like you said. Is going to be those electronics it's having that foot controlled trolling motor it's having you know uh, maybe a shallow water anchor to stay in that spot it's having uh, a good electronics to locate fish to locate the structure to find those things that are going to help me catch more fish and i don't fish competitively i've yeah. never done it but just be able to go out and like yeah i it'll help you have a good day if the fishing's tougher i'm going to enjoy my day more if i have that yeah and i, I think the main thing that People get mad about it as they're like, it's cheating. It's taking the fun out of fishing. That's fine. Then don't get it. Mm -hmm. No one's forcing you to get forward-facing sonar. I think the main thing is it's so expensive. And I know people are like, ah, it's not expensive. It's only four or $5,000. It's like, yeah, well, most of us can't <laughs> afford that. Yeah. Does it give you an advantage? Yep. It can 100% give you an advantage. 
the people that are mad are the people that don't have it that don't have that advantage yeah. in a tournament like andrew said everyone has it anyway yeah so no one's at but an yeah, advantage in a professional level tournament everyone has it. yeah but say like we were fishing a deep water lake with rocks and and the fish were spread out and andrew had forward facing sonar and i couldn't afford it then totally he would be in an advantage so you can mm-hmm. see why i would be mad at that because it's something that i can't afford yeah in let's reality, say, let's say you're, you go to Kawartha's and you're like oh i'm gonna enter this tournament i have my little setup I have side scan. I don't have live scope though. And then the Johnson brothers show up. Live scope is your last thing you should worry about. It's unfair because they're there. Yes, they have all the equipment, but like you, you look skill. at these, it's these guys, they know how to use it. If I have all the equipment right now today and I went fishing tomorrow, I have no clue how to use it. Yeah. Cause I, I don't, I've never used it before. Life it's not going to help you. doesn't improve you your skills as an angler. Yes. Like you may be able to find fish better, but you still have to catch the so fish. It, it can give you an advantage, but it's not cheating. Yeah, it that's doesn't a, make that's fish a big, jump in your boat. That's a big <laughs> rant. Realistically, if you can afford it, get it. If yeah. not, like I, I don't have any ill thought of, of it. I used yeah. to be totally against it, but like, oh, it's, who if, cares? If you own, you know, premium fishing equipment, then you're cheating because you should be fishing Zebco and Ugly Sticks. Like, yeah. No, we have technology now. <laughs> yeah. Here's a good question from Paddleheads. Adam or Ben said, if you could change anything about the fishing industry or how anglers interact with it, what would it be? Uh, I think if I could change anything, it's just I see too many times when people say, oh, I just don't understand the regulations. Like the regulations are there because there has been an overuse of or or over harvesting or whatnot of all these different species of fish. And it has in the last like generation has changed so much of how fishing is in a local area because it's hit hard. And you understand it's going to have like we have an impact everywhere we are. I'm not trying to be like, oh, all like social justice warrior or anything like that. But there's so many people still that are it's like, oh, well, I, I can do this. It's my right to do so. And they're going to keep their limit of whatever. So for me, I would say to add something that could be changed would just be besides like, oh, everyone just be nice and polite and love each other. <laughs> it's like if I could implement a change, it would be to lower uh, the legal limit to instead of like fish per day. It's like, OK, you can have. Instead of six bass every single day when you go out and fishing, you can keep four a year. I don't care. Like, I don't I don't eat. I eat bass if I haven't caught walleye, and that's what I'll keep. I'm not saying that's an extreme, like, reduction. But reducing the amount of stuff that you can keep, because some people, and, they get, and oftentimes they're the ones who don't follow the law anyways, and they, they're just taking way too many fish and harvesting way too much. Yeah, I do agree that the regulations need to be lowered a bit on some of the especially the popular lakes near us. Uh, To answer that same question, if I had to change something about the fishing industry and how anglers interact with it, what would it be? One thing that always annoys me, and I know we all get sucked in, like I'm a collector, I like buying lures, but I'm not stupid enough to think that you actually need all this crap to catch fish. (laughs) We catch fish on like the most basic lures. On the same five lures. (laughs) Exactly. One thing that I hate is, you know, on Instagram and YouTube, you'll see a lot like pro staff and like a new bait will come out this company comes out with this line of soft plastics and they're all, this company comes up with that line of soft plastics and people fall for like just the stupidity of like these pro staffers telling people like, this is the bait you need to catch. You won't catch fish if you don't get this. And all these rookie anglers come in and be like, I need this bait. And it's all marketing. Yeah. These fish are not intelligent. They're not going to be able to tell the difference between this and that. Some new lures that come out are innovative and they're Mm -hmm. great, but generally speaking, fishing lures haven't really changed that much and you don't really need anything fancy like you can literally go with five or ten lures and catch fish you don't need like all these colors and you don't need all this and all that and all these new baits and stuff and it's yeah. it's literally all marketing I, I feel like the fishing industry like every industry in the world it's about making money it's yeah. not about helping people catch fish that's why we do this podcast because we like to talk about our experiences like we'll tell you like oh we bought this lure and it sucked and i wouldn't buy it again and then we're like, hey, these are the best lures for pike. It's lures you already have probably. Mm-hmm. You know, like you don't. And there there are some that are more expensive that we buy because we enjoy using it. And yeah. we, we buy it because, hey, let's try this. Is it better? It might have some small advantages. But just on the jig episode we just did, it's like like you can have a ball head jig with a twister tail on the back. One of the most oldest classic soft plastic baits known to man. And you and I can go out in the water and have a productive day with just fishing that. Yeah. You don't need everything. Yeah. And you watch these YouTube channels about like professionals fishing. And like when you're high stakes angler, yes, every little detail can matter. Mm-hmm. That's why they're using all these you know expensive fluorocarbon lines and all these super small, like fancy baits and all this stuff like that. 
You don't need that if you're just a normal average guy going out fishing. You don't need that. But the industry makes it feel like you do. Mm -hmm. And we all fall for it to a certain extent, but some people just overboard fall for it. Like some people are like, oh, you need this $35 jerk bait. You won't catch fish on anything mm -hmm. else. But yet we'll go out and catch fish on, on Rapala's that cost nine ninety nine. Yeah. So again, when money's not on the line and you're not a professional and you can just have fun and go fishing. Yep. You don't have to spend a million bucks. Yeah. Anyway, that was a long rant again. I love these <laughs> rants. So this is going to be our last question and it's not really a question. Oh, I guess it is. So it's from uh, Jeff, your old school buddy. Oh, yeah. JR Fishing and Hunting. <laughs> and this, we're going to go in a little Hi, bit Jeff. in depth as the end. He says, when are we going to have an AOA family-friendly fishing derby? The answer is, we weren't going to talk about this, but since he asked the question, the answer is next year, 2024, we are having the AOA fishing tournament. And it's going to yes. be really cool. We haven't gone over all the details, but I have talked to a lot of people who are ready I'm to go super excited this it's, is this is going to be a tournament that is uh different than what's running on your local tournament series so right now we want to hear some of the details this is pretty cool okay so i wasn't trying much in way so i was trying to be like i know it, it's going to be really vague. cool so all the proceeds are going to charity yep no one's making a dime off this tournament it's going to be fun there's going to be prizes uh, not a lot of prizes but there will be some prizes so mm -hmm. if you'd like to sponsor a part of this eventually when we start talking about it definitely reach out to us yep but it's going to be very interesting. So you can either apply for two sections, okay? You will get advantages for either section. So yes. one section is going to be small craft anglers. We're talking kayaks, canoes, small mm -hmm. tin boats, okay? You will get advantages being in that section. The other section will be pro-am, guys with boats, guys and girls that own bigger boats, bass boats, big aluminum boats, anything with over a 20 horsepower engine. Yeah. You will have to draw your partner from a hat. <laughs> so if you would like to join the Pro-Am, yeah. you can donate slightly more money to the charity and give the guy who's driving the boat a little bit of gas money and you will get to go out in a pretty sweet boat. We have a few guys already that said they'd 100% be down for it and some of them own pretty big boats. Yeah, so there's some pretty, there's will, some awesome guys that are down to do yeah. this. And it, it'll be a fun tournament. It will not be competitive. It's going to be fun. Yeah. And it's going to a healthy competition. Healthy, that's, healthy that's fun like, hey, competition. Like we're, yeah, we're going to, we're going to have, like just said, the prizes. So we're going to have, you know, a way of, of measuring or making sure your fish is measured and, and we know what's, who should get who's deserving of what prize but yeah but it's going to be fun and yeah, again you might have I'm the opportunity excited. to fish with someone um, with a little more experience than you and learn something while you're out there in the water as well as fishing a boat in a bigger boat which is always fun i got to fish with my buddy paul the other day he has a pretty nice boat and we were flying down the lake and i was like this is amazing my <laughs> boat only goes 10 kilometers an hour <laughs> and he was like what i can't hear you <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> so anyway if you're interested in that send me a, a message on instagram just tell me like I'm interested. Let me know. I just want to kind of gauge interest of people that would like to do it. It will be in the Kawartha Lakes area. Mm -hmm. So I've had some people tell me that they would drive, you know, like three hours. And I'm like, oh, that's crazy. But we're going to, we're, we're wanting to get about 25 participants. We'll make it really interesting. And yeah. me and Andrew will be there and some other people too as well. So it'll be pretty cool. But we're way over time for this episode. Yes. That is a really exciting that episode. Was a, that was a big leak that you yeah, just dropped I know. there. I but leaked. It's exciting. Just like Andrew's rubber boots. <laughs> That's sad because it's true. <laughs> so we would like to thank Wool Love Apparel again for the amazing giveaway. 75 bucks for their website. Again, mm -hmm. all that information for them and their website and the promo code uh, for 15% off is all down in the show notes. Everything else is linked down in the show notes as well for all some of the lures that we talked about today as well. So just as a brief recap, you didn't laugh the first time, so I'm going to say it again. Fall is cold. But the fishing can be hot. <laughs> right? Yeah, yes, that's true, Jesse. Okay. All right. Can you do better? Uh, What's the quote of the day? Quote of the day? Uh, I don't know if it's going to be a pun. I'm not going to do better. But I would say uh, go big or go small. That's, that's a tip for fall fishing. 